Welcome to Clay Mastermind with Don Grant. Mental excellence and industry insights. Brought to you by The Clay Lab, your ultimate podcast for mastering the mental game of clay shooting and gaining exclusive insights from the top minds in the industry. Join us as we dive into the strategies of elite athletes, uncover the secrets to peak performance, and share powerful techniques to enhance your shooting skill. Plus, get behind the scenes access to the leaders and innovators who are shaping the future of the clay shooting industry. Get ready to elevate your game, sharpen your focus, and gain insider knowledge from the best in the business. Let's get started. Here's your host, Dawn Grant. I'm excited to introduce you all to David Young, who is a very serious weekend warrior, if not a little bit more than a weekend warrior, on a mission, and um, has also been one of my mental training clients. And I'm um, looking forward to everybody learning about David and, and maybe you know gaining some insight from him and the journey that he's been on. So thanks, David. Yeah, thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? So uh, I'm David Young. So we, uh, you know, I started clay shooting uh, back in 2000. We moved to Charleston in 2019. COVID hits in 2020. Everything's closed down. But funny thing about that was a lot of ranges did not close. And so I started shooting out of Kiowa. And one day I was up at the five stand. I was having trouble with a crosser. And Elizabeth Fennell came out and, and helped me correct my problem. And everything was kind of history from there. I started shooting with her uh, quite a bit that, that summer of 2020. Nice. And it, it kind of filled a hole in occupied time for us recently having moved to Charleston. One of the other questions you had was um, on recent accomplishments or milestones. I don't have a mm -hmm. lot of shooting accomplishments or milestones. Um, from that point forward, in 2020, um, no big wins, several top three finishes and, you know, a variety of things. And then in 21, my, you know, my big accomplishment was I got pancreatic cancer and I survived mm. that. And it kind of changed my whole view of shooting, how I thought about it, how I thought about life, how I thought about things in general and uh, overcame that and, and fortunately moved on from it, but mm -hmm. lost that year of 2021. Mm. But, you know, that inspired me to start shooting a bunch in 2022 and 23. And uh, 23, I shot uh, over 10,000 registered targets. Uh, at this point, kind of three years, three years into my clay journey, I've shot 56 tournaments and 24,000 registered targets. Amazing. Incredible. And you love it, obviously. I, I do. And like you said, it's been a journey with a lot of twists and turns and forks in the road. Yeah. What have you seen is a progression, which I would consider an accomplishment. So, you know, how have you progressed over those years? What do you see different in yourself and your shooting? You know, when, when you start out, to me, it's 75 percent mechanics and 25 percent metal. So you're trying to get your mechanics right. You know, you're shooting more to get better. And as you, you progress, I think, and, and move up the ladder from you know, a lower class to an upper class, a double A AA or a master, whatever the case might be, it becomes more, more mental. And shooting more doesn't necessarily make you better. And I've proven that over mm. and over again. <laughs> yeah, you have. <laughs> As I like to shoot, and I shot a lot, and at some point, I'm sort of scratching my head and saying, you know, that worked early, but it did. It, it hasn't worked this past mm. year as well as it did much earlier in my in my shooting career. So that part of the journey uh, really changed me. And, and in 22 and 23, when I shot all those registered targets, you know, you're you're moving through the classes, you're moving up. But then it becomes a matter of, of being more intentional uh, about your training. And it, it kind of depends on how serious you are about advancing and competing and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. But if you, you want to be respectable and in the competition, I, I think you have to become more intentional uh, about a lot mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So you've seen yourself improve related to, well, it's, it sounds like, you know, your journey, your mechanics and the repetition through the frequency of your shooting and the practicing of what you've learned um, got you to a certain point. 
And then you felt like I need to now add to that. And that's when you started realizing the mental side. Is what yeah, saying, that, that's right? exactly right. And it, and it would be your, you know, you're, you're out on the course and you're making good shots and you're making bad shots and you're scratching your head and you're saying to yourself, why can't you repeat that? And you've got these hundred voices going on in your head. And I heard somebody say something the other day that I thought made a lot of sense. You know, I assume everybody has the voice going on in their head at particular times when they're in competition or shooting or training or whatever the case might be. And the question was, you know, that voice and and all those things that are going on in your head, if you could consider it a person, would it be a friend of yours? Would it be? (laughs) Would it be? That's what you're saying. Would it be a friend of yours? Is is it helping you? And, you know, that kind of got my attention from a standpoint of, well, I got a lot of stuff, as you well know, I have a lot of stuff going on up there. I don't necessarily think it's been my friend. Yeah. Well, and so I believe that everybody, you know, depending on kind of how they are naturally, like, are they analytical? Are they math minded? Are they like entrepreneur? Are they the type that like gets things done? And so to me, that is an important thing to look at because it does play into like the kind of mind you have that you're bringing to the shotgun table per se. So tell us what kind of brain do you have? What, what did you end up doing for a living and such? You know, we, we moved to, I, I grew up in a farm family, so I grew up on the farm. So I never lived in a town of more than a thousand people until I was 30 years of age. You know, mother kicked me out of the door. I had a BB gun, a pellet gun, you know, had a, a 22 rifle, but I could only shoot birdshot if anybody knows what that is. They went to a 410 and so forth. Shooting's always been an important part of life. And, you know, I was in that environment until I was 30 years of old uh, of age, met my wife, Robin, who's from the city. And she said, well, I'm not living there. <laughs> and so <laughs> we were getting a little more serious, moved to Newburgh, North Carolina, started a um, a brokerage office for a major brokerage firm, was there for 25 years, then became a partner of that firm, lived in St. Louis, and then came back to Charleston, which we talked about a little bit earlier. You know, that was one of those things that required me to get up every day and kind of think about what I was doing and kind of make things happen. And one of the two, two things that I think work against me and you, you can't take a very successful previous career and think it's transferable to shooting. Mm. Because what it takes to be successful in business and other sort of ventures is not necessarily what it's going to take to be successful in, in shooting. And I overthink everything. If there's two things I know that I do that could be improved is I overthink everything and I try to make things happen instead of letting things happen. Mm-hmm. And set expectations that sometimes that are unrealistic. And, you know, so that, that's kind of your downfall is you, you work harder and try to make things happen and you get further from the results you want. And that's one of the things that you've brought, brought to my attention. So that was a complete shift for me. Well, yeah, because it was like, I don't know, 30, 40 years or something like that in a yeah, career where you thought for a living, you analyze information, you know, an authority, you felt good about like, not only what I've thought about and what I've analyzed, but now what I'm going to advise this whole other person to do and take charge of that situation to some degree. Right. So, um, and, and a doer to make things happen and evolve and to even move up the ladder per se. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it was one of those things where it was just kind of the opposite when, when I started shooting and especially at a higher level. And it was, you know, I, I know if I've got a good pre-shot program, a good shot plan, I know if I'm seeing the target well, if I can just shut everything off and focus on that particular moment at that time, good things really happen. Yes. But that's hard. And there's there's really... I mean, if you want to be stronger, you work out. If you want to be better in business, you take classes and you become more analytical. If you want to be a better shooter, you have to, to me, and I had to learn the mental process of exercising what I needed to do when and know when to turn all of that stuff off and let it come to me. For sure. And again, if you like anything, like even like your mechanics, you repeat, 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 and then it becomes automatic behavior. Repeat, 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 analyzing information, you know, thinking about things, repeat that for 30, 40 years. And then yeah, how do I not do that when I'm on the shotgun 
sport field, you know, and um, that's something to almost unlearn, but not to get rid of it because you do, you know, you got this great smart brain. You need to be able to assess and analyze the information, assess the the projection of the target, the the weather, the surroundings, you know, you know, these different things and even have conscious recall of something you're working on, like fully mounting or follow through or whatever. And while you're overcoming these natural tendencies to like analyze it to death, right? Yeah, you're not giving you're not giving it up, but you have to turn it on and turn it off at the right times. And, you know, I, I just wasn't aware of how important that was until I went through some of the training with you. And then I'd look at some of this stuff that, that you advocated to think about and how to turn it on and turn it off. And I'd say, okay, I get it. I mean, because there was example after example after example of something that might be an obstacle to you as a, as a shooter that you needed to learn to turn on or turn off at a particular time. And it was right on target. And so it was a paradigm shift for me that helped me look at mentally and emotionally what I might do differently as a shooter. And I can't say that I'm totally there, but I'm a lot I, I'm a closer. I'll put it that way. The thing that has helped me the most is I know how to think about it now, but the difference between knowing how to think about it and going out and thinking about it and doing it are two different things. So, uh, but I do feel comfortable that I know w- what will get me to my goals and, and level as far as a shooter is concerned. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. Uh, so again, what's the, the beliefs and mindsets are programmed in the subconscious mind through repetition the same way that mechanics are programmed into the subconscious mind through repetition. So if, if we just look at simple repetition and periods of time, um, you know, the period of time that you analyzed is ingrained in there, no different than like knowing how to drive a stick shift or knowing how to ride a bike or something. You could say the same for shooting mechanics, but maybe you've been riding a bike more in your life. I don't know, but it's the same idea. So it's the same as a habit as well. So let's somebody say somebody has a smoking habit or a drinking habit or picking their hair, picking their eyebrow hair. That's a habit some people have. Um, you know, there's all these different habits and the repetition is what puts it into the subconscious. And then once it's there, you have to, if you're going to override it, you have to do, be very deliberate and very conscious and very mindful every single time until you create a new habit with repetition of the new thing. And meanwhile, you're having to override this habit or a belief system or whatever that's already been reinforced over and over again. And that's why they say it takes 28 days to change a habit or whatever. But you would have to be, you would every day you would have to be deliberate and, and perfect in whatever it is that you're trying to create the new habit in. And that's why I like talking about what you did for a career, because there's so many, so many days and years of repetition uh, that are already in that subconscious. And hypnosis is really helpful to get in there and change that programming faster. But you're human. So if your natural tendency is to be analytical, then you go right back out there. Uh, You're going to be analyzing overanalyzing, let's say, not analyzing to a healthy degree, um, as a knee-jerk reaction that you would have to work on regularly. Yeah, yeah you go back to what, what you've, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 71 uh, next, next week. So after that many years of approaching problems and decision-making in one particular way to change that is no small no, no small obstacle. And, you know, to me, I know that if, if I plan all the way up till I call pull and I know where the gun's going and I can let go. And Gavin Miles says this all the time on his videos. He says, you know, clear your mind. Well, that's a difficult thing to do and let your, you know, and trust your subconscious to take over and, and, and perform the shot because you've already programmed yourself into what you're going to do with the gun, where it's going to go, how you're going to see it, where you're going to pick it up, where the, you know, the kill zone is, you know, then if you, if you quit trying to help it, and that's been a really hard thing for me, 
then good things usually happen. But you have to trust it and you have to have that confidence. And I think what the training has done is it's given me a platform for how to think about those things and a newfound confidence and a newfound trust in that. And you have to have that before you can turn off those voices. And that's the thing. It's much easier said than done, right? And it definitely underestimated. Um, you know, I was working with student athlete golfers at H Hank Haney's uh, Academy in Hilton Head years ago. And one day we were all on the driving range and Hank Haney was there as well. And, you know, they were all starstruck. All the students were starstruck that Hank was there. And, you know, I was doing the mental, he was doing the mechanics. So at one point he came over to where I was standing next to a student and he told the boy, beautiful swing. You've got great form. You've really got something going on here but you need to work on your focus. And then Hank <laughs> literally turned and walked away. And I'll never forget that moment because I watched him walk away and I was like, I wonder if he could expand on that or similar to Gavin, like just telling somebody work on your focus or work on letting go or whatever it is. Like, do they know how to actually advise that student on how to do it? And I wouldn't expect them to. I mean, like I'm degreed in psychology and have spent my whole life teaching people things like this. So it's uh, like anything else. You learn it as you go and you get better and better and better. But I looked at that student and he did what I call like Batman laser vision eyes. His interpretation of you just need to focus better squinted his eyes and he looked harder down at the ball and then he looked harder down range and then he looked harder there and then he like wax it, you know, and I was like, that's what he thinks focus is, right? And um, there's so much more to it than that. Yeah, but I think, you know, you, you know, and that's exactly right. And that's a great story because you're not necessarily trained. I mean, you're trained to do exercises and mechanics and all the things that you think will contribute to the game, and they do. But you're not trained mentally to do the exercises that will get you mentally conditioned to be where you need to be to compete. And that, that's, that was the mystery to me is... I couldn't figure that part of it out until I went through your program. And then it was kind of like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. I get it. I had two business coaches when I was in business. And so, you know, what I would suggest to people and what I have found is you want to find, if you want to go someplace that you've never been before, mm -hmm. you want to find somebody that you trust that can guide you to get there, that knows the, the road. And I think when it comes to mental conditioning, that is you know, that is the challenge. Find that person. And for me, you've been that person that helped me navigate that, just like the two business coaches. And I'm not an easy person to coach because <laughs> I'm pretty stubborn about a lot of things. But uh, again, find that person that will help you, that, that knows how to get there and knows how to navigate that journey. Because by myself, I don't think I could do it. Well, you're working with the same information that got you to where you were. Like you just don't even have it. Like you have to learn something. And it's almost like putting new software into a computer. Like that computer is only going to function a certain way until you add more software for the new skill you want it to do. And so wherever a person is at like this moment in time, they're working off the data that they have. And so unless they gather new data, new information and insight, and then in my opinion, like actual training, not just like, let me read a book or let me do a one day workshop and download and then try to figure out how to implement it. I think that's very different. And I think you can get light bulb moments from something like that. But to me, it has to be training no different than you would go to a shooting instructor, right? Like I'm going to learn something and then I'm going to practice it. And then next week or two weeks later, I'm going to learn something else and then I'm going to practice it. You know, it takes you through a process. And I know you believe in instruction and you also like you have a personal trainer even, right? Like we all can, yeah. we're all capable of working out, but that uh, personal trainer holds you accountable and also make sure your form is correct and teaches you something new each time and, and kind of keeps you on a, a journey, a path, right? Yeah, but plus it shows your commitment. I mean, I think in addition, and all the things you said are correct, but it shows your commitment to getting better. And, you know, I, th I think that's very, it, it, you know, there's, you know, there's what you say, and then there's the deeds that you do. And 
you know, it demonstrates that you have the commitment to get there. And, I, you know, I think, you know, hiring a coach for me at any stage, you know, particularly over the years, and I've had three or four, demonstrated that commitment, but it also helped me in two very distinct things. It helped me understand what I needed to do to get better, and it helped me understand how I could work out mentally, in this case, to, to get better. And you need both of those things, and you need that commitment to go with. Yeah, have you seen, like, over the years, the type of instructor, mechanics instructor, the type of information that you needed related to mechanics had changed over the years? I think the, all of sports have changed, including sporting clays. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's evolved to the point where, uh, you know, you take a look at targets and competition 20 years ago in any sport, including sporting clays, and where it's at today, it's remarkable how much it's advanced. And are the shotguns better? Are the shells better? No, it's a combination of a lot of things, including the mental skill training that goes with it. And people didn't do that. I mean, you were either born with it or you weren't. You couldn't train yourself into it. You know, it was thought for a lot of years. Well, I think you can make some progress. You may maybe won't become, you know, the next Seth Curry or, or uh, Caitlin Clark or, you know, who a, gen a generational athlete, but you can get you can get better if you understand or committed and, and will work out. Yeah, I just had a, an analogy come to my mind, you know, eating healthy and having a good doctor and taking care of your body and all that. And, it, and I was just thinking about how important it is to find a doctor who's on the same page as you, right? Like some doctors are very Western and all about prescriptions and all about this and that. And then like for me, because I'm a little bit more holistic than I like an integrative medicine doctor who's like, you know, how's your diet? How's um, your supplements and your herbs or whatever, as well as, you know, you may or may not need prescriptions. So, but if for me, if I went to a very Western doctor, I'm probably not going to like what he has to say. I'm not going to agree with him, but he he's going to think he's doing the right thing. Right. So what that made me think of is shooting instructors like Joe and I. So, you know, here we are engaged. We've been together three and a half years. He's an instructor, but he believes in the mental game, right? And to obviously him and I are compatible because he supports and believes in what I do. But for someone to go to an instructor who believes in the mental side, but also can be humble enough to be like, you need to focus better and you need to stop analyzing, but I can't help you with that. Like, I don't know enough about it. And so, you know, and then to point you in the direction of an expert in that area. So have you seen that, you know, working No with question about it. This is a very macho, you know, sort of ego-driven sport. Not that all sports don't have some element of that in it. But I think the people that have really succeeded in athletics of all kinds, particularly in shooting, you know, have started to embrace the, the mental, mental side of the game and understanding that better. And, and that's been a part of the evolution, I think, in, in the sport. I mean, you take the top, the top, you've got some generational athletes there that, you know, maybe just have the it, whatever the it is. Mm -hmm. But then you've got a number of people that are competing at levels just out of sheer commitment and understanding the game, understanding the mental, the physical and other part of it. And it reminds me of something that Charlie Munger, who is Warren Buffett's partner, said, you know, about getting better at anything. Go to bed smarter than you woke up. And it's accumulation mm -hmm. of those little things over time. Be open to suggestions. Try things. And if you're a little smarter each night over the course of a lifetime, you're going to get a lot better. So what is it that you want to get better at? And when you look at your game today, when I looked at mine, it was, I want to learn how to think better mm -hmm. about it. And not think when I don't need to be thinking. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And so that kind of led me down that path. And so it's that, that little thing that if, you know, you continue to get better at, it makes a big difference over. Well, and I've seen some of the top shooters start dabbling in offering mental game strategies or clinics or classes or whatever. And to me, there's no comparison. Like they're great at what they do, right? And nothing against that. They're extremely successful at what they're, they're doing, but it's like going to get your oil changed and someone that knows the basics of an engine versus someone who can take apart the engine and put it back together, even if it's like, you know, some modern day electrical engine or whatever. And uh, to me, that's the difference. You, you could, you could hit the surface and get a little bit of dabbling with some of the mental game with someone who's not an expert at it. 
or you can go to an expert and really dive in and, and tap. Yeah, and I, I, don't, I, I don't think a lot of really good shooters could explain that as well as they could the mechanics because it's been all about mechanics for so long. But I think there's a lot of people that are waking up and saying, you know, there's a, the mental aspect of this that is a big component of it that if you're going to get better, you need to learn how to do that. And you need to learn the exercises. Another analogy came to my mind, and that's like if somebody's struggling to go to sleep, there's kind of quick fixes like sleeping pill, right? Or just frustration and don't know what to do. And then they keep struggling and say, I have a, I have a sleep problem. Or they can learn techniques to manage their mind and mindfully and deliberately do those things so it doesn't happen necessarily overnight. But that's available to everybody. But something I've observed is people tend to like the fast food version, right? They they tend to go to the sleeping pill to just try to get this quick fix versus I'm the supervisor of my mind. I just never knew how to supervise it. Nobody's ever taught me. And the hell with this. It's time to go to sleep. And I'm the one in charge. And we're going to sleep, you know? <laughs> But you have to exercise that. I mean, you have to you have to practice it to get better. And it goes back to what I said a little bit earlier. And it was, you know, somebody describes it. So the voices in your head, whether you're trying to go to sleep or trying to, you know, be a better shot on a, on a sporting clay course, you know, is are those voices your friend? Mm -hmm. Or are they obstructing you from doing things that, that you feel like and know you, you could do better? And in order to get to a point where they're not interfering with your performance, whether it's sleeping or shooting, sporting clays or whatever, mm -hmm. you have to understand how that works and the exercises that you can do to go a different direction or, and control that. And, and that is so critical, not only in shooting, but to make your whole life. Yeah, that's one. Of, that's the win-win, right? That's the win-win. And it's definitely a win-win. I definitely promote that I help shooters or athletes to improve their performance, right? But I also have built into it, like, you can't just try to practice focus on Saturday or Sunday in a competition. You can't just try to not overanalyze something on Saturday. You have to practice this as a human being in every waking moment that's possible. And here's how you're going to do that. And then you got to actually do it and then you'll see some improvement. It, it doesn't just happen because you're like, oh, OK, I got to stop analyzing and let me do that this weekend. And in my experience, that is absolutely correct. And, you know, we, we talked about this at the beginning of the course. Well, I had, had prostate cancer. And so I printed out all your material and then I just read it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to commit some time and effort to it. For it to sink in it's like anything thing that you want to change it, it doesn't come from osmosis of handling the paper or putting it on your pillow or whatever the case might be you've actually got to put a little effort into it and you're so right about that i'm glad you brought that up because you know i have to tell that story <laughs> cracks me up so so david so you know i own amelia shotgun sports david was coming down doing instruction with joe and so we would go to dinner together, you know, so there was several times where you'd come down, we'd gone to dinner together and he would, David would be like, oh yeah, I've done your mental program. But then over conversation over dinner and all, I'd hear him say things like that. I just felt like, I don't feel like he did the course because I think he would know the answer to that or he still wouldn't be struggling with that particular thing. <laughs> and so I don't even know how many times, how many dinners or how many times. And even with Joe after dinner, I'd be like, I just don't think he's done my online course. He keeps saying he has, but something's off. And so it was a while later that because I kept inquiring and trying to figure out like, why isn't this adding up? And you ended up saying without realizing it was even a thing you were like well yeah I did it I read it all and I said I was like read what it's all videos right it's like 21 videos like an hour and a half two hours each and you said I, I printed it and I read it and I was like holy crap that's what it is because what what you printed was just pdf presentation I mean powerpoint 
a PowerPoint presentation that was mostly pictures with titles and a few bullet points. And that's literally what you had done and believed that you had done the course fine. Well, I, gone through it. You know, I, I tried the easy fix. And what I would say to people is this is not an easy fix. It, it's a meaningful change. It's not mm. an easy fix. But what a difference once you actually oh, started the online yeah, course, it's, right? It's, it's huge. And, and, and I said, damn, I got to watch those hour long, hour and a half long videos. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> well, I honestly did it and it was a difference. It was a difference maker. So uh, all I'm saying is you can't just read the material. You can't just gloss over it. You've got to be committed. You've got to spend the time in it. And it's like anything else. If you don't spend the time in it, you're not going to get the results. Yes. But it's worth it. Well, here's the PowerPoint version and here's the video version. <laughs> yeah. So you had said early in this this call here that early, that early on you felt like it was, I think you said 20 or 25%. Yeah, 25%. Mental, what's your feeling now on the, the phrase, it's 90% mental? Oh, I don't know if anybody knows exactly what the percentage is. I just think it's a lot of, a, a lot of mental. And you know, how, how do you put that on the course in competition? How do you put it on the course in, in, in practice? And, you know, a lot my, my practices have changed. There's a cadence, there's, you know, pre-shot shot planning and so forth. If, if you've answered all the questions in your conscious mind before you call full and you can clear everything out and let the library take over, you know, I, it, it's gold, it's magical, it really is. And, you know, so that that's the hard part, but that's the way it's manifested itself or changed the way I practice, the way I think about it. Am I there now? Not completely, but I, I know where I want to be. The rest is up to me. Well, and I know that with Joe, you work a lot on focusing on the process, the process, the process, right? Which is a great way because the conscious mind can only focus on one thing at a time. So it's either going to be overthinking something or potentially i'm mean, obviously everybody's different but for the very analytical person it could be like overthinking the shot the previous station the score the streak you may or may not be on trying to replicate something you know trying to replicate a shot so all those are examples of like over analyzing so if the conscious mind can only focus on one thing at a time then you go wait you're back you like get over here that's the supervising of the mind like get over here and do what I'm telling you to do. And right now it's focused on the process, right? Yeah. yeah. And you know, that, that's the other thing. Expectations are a good and a bad thing. That's sort of a double-edged sword. So, you know, what are your expectations of practice? What are your expectations in the tournament? And my expectation is if, if I'm doing well on the process, the result will take care of itself. But if I'm concentrating too much on the last miss or the score or whatever the case might be, it takes the fun out of it. And it puts me in a position of, of forgetting to concentrate on the thing that's probably going to lead to a good score, which is, you know, do I have a consistent process? Am I looking at it right? Am I starting a gun in the same place each time? Am I seeing details? Am I, you know, if I think about those things, then the breaks take care of themselves. And, and um, it, it is kind of magical. Yeah. But you trust that. You have to have the confidence that you have the equipment, whether it's mental or mechanics or whatever the case might be, you have to have the confidence and the trust that, that to, to do that. Otherwise you're thinking yourself, you know, thinking when you don't need to be thinking. Confidence and trust being too important. Yeah. yeah. Two, two important mental game elements. You said it can feel magical, which I would assume you're talking about the zone and shooting instinctively or intuitively. So what's your experience been with shooting intuitively, instinctively, or being in the zone? You know, it, it's happened in places, I guess the, the place that it happened really early in, in my career was, you know, I'd, it was at the U.S. Open when it was at Backwoods, and I, it was, um, you know, a few years ago, and I was shooting a D-class 28-gauge, I don't know what sporting I think it was. And there was just something about that event. I won that event and I was thinking to myself, well, you know, I've got a, a cheese board and a cutter from the U.S. Open. So even though it's D-class, I've still got a trophy I could put up. Mm -hmm. And it during that process or during that round, it was kind of like, I don't, it was, it was so, 
enjoyable and so relaxing and so there was no doubt in it and it was okay i'm gonna i'm gonna start here i i can see it i can see detail there and it was just, you know, look at it and break it. And, and a lot of instructors, and Joe gets irritated with me, and he says, just look at it and shoot it. And, I don't and know. Does he really say it like that, David? Yeah, no. He's, <laughs> I can't repeat what, what, what he says on here, I don't think. Well, you could edit it. I've had a few tournaments in February this year where, you know, some events were, were like that. And so it wasn't worrying about missing a shot it was just going out there and letting it happen and enjoying the day and you know i think that is the that is a place that i'd like to be because i'm getting too old to fight and uh, an experience that's not enjoyable and it's it's too too much fun to be had that arena not to be having it. yeah so this zone magical state that feels great did you experience it much prior to the last few years no not at all in fact i'm getting it more sporadically i can recognize it i get a feeling for sort of what gets me there what gets in the way of it Mm -hmm. um but you know if you watch a seth curry or a caitlin clark or you know a magic johnson or any number of competitors there's a certain joy in what what they're doing. There's no worries about it. Mm -hmm. It's total trust. Mm -hmm. And when you get in that space, if you're quick mentally, you know what you want to do in that station, and then you just let it go, it's magical. Mm -hmm. But that's saying a lot. I mean, it's, it's a lot of things happening, but it's not any more difficult than I make it. Yes. And I am the best at making it difficult. If I get out of my own way and if I just concentrate on the process and let it go and let the game come to me instead of trying to make it happen, that's that's when the best things happen. Yeah, and great testimonial to an accomplishment that you've had over your career of shooting because... First of all, some people have experienced the zone here and there sporadically. I personally believe I'm training people to experience it more often and for longer periods of time. And there are some folks out there that don't think that's possible. Uh, They don't think you can train on the zone. Uh, You and I have talked a lot about that the zone is the elimination of all the crud that's keeping you out of it. It's a very natural state. It's totally achievable. Every human on the planet, and it's not just for shooting, it's your peak performance state as a human. And absolutely, you can get in it more and more um, by learning what it feels like when you're dipping into it, how to keep yourself there, what's taking you out of it, eliminate the things taking you out of it. And you just, you have to know that stuff and work it, right? Yeah, and, and what I would say, to, in, in my mind, it sort of simplifies that whether you believe you can or you can't, both are probably true. Mm, yeah. If you believe you can, there's probably going to be times when you can. If you believe you can't, then you'll never get there. And so a lot of that has to do with what you believe. For sure. And and for someone to say it's not possible, just is their really limited understanding of their mind? Is they, If they don't think that that's something that's achievable or trainable, then they don't understand the mind well enough to even say that, right? Um, so I like that you brought up fun because that's another element of, I think, peak performance that's important and can be misconstrued by some. Some pe- some people are like, "Well, I'm here to win. I'm not here to have fun." You know. So, what's your definition of fun, and whether you think it's important for a good? Well, let's put that in perspective. I mean, you're shooting sporting plays. You've got a bunch of rednecks with shotguns, pickup trucks, side by sides, and fried food. I mean, what's not <laughs> in a beautiful day? I mean, you put all of those things together. What's not the like? I mean, yeah, you know. Right. You know, to me, be in the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we shoot beautiful courses at high-level tournaments, and we have great people. There's not very many people in sporting plays that I've met that I I didn't didn't like. You know, sort of the intersection of values and beliefs. It's a wonderful opportunity. It Mm -hmm. reminds me of something Kid Rock said. It said, we're here for a good time. We're not here for a long time. Make it count. Ooh, I like that. Make it count. Yeah. 
And you're right. Those are all great things to have fun doing. So what would keep someone from having fun when you're got guns, you're blowing things up, you're eating great food, you're talking to great people? Like what makes it not fun? I think it's expectations. Mm-hmm. I mean, you go there with a, with a certain expectation. What What is your expectation for the day? What's your expectation for the tournament? What's your expectation for the next station? What's your ex- expectation for the next event? Well, you know, my, my expectations have shifted to more of, I'm going to do the best I possibly can in process. I have total confidence and trust in those things. And then I'm just going to let it go and quit trying to make it happen. Enjoy the day. And shooting relax is, you know, what I have discovered is considerably better than shooting with a lot of tension. Mm. And, you know, there's just kind of a fine line in there where, you know, you can start to spiral out of control because you're not meeting your expectations. And then all of a sudden it turns into a bad day. And so I can see how that that could happen. And it's happened to me a number of times. I I just want to avoid that. And you'd be aware of of what what makes me start that spiral down the toilet. I don't remember if it was. So Joe and I were listening to the Dead Pair podcast the other day with Neil Chadwick. And they were talking about like the U.S. Open versus the Nationals and the Regionals and the level of target difficulty and belief systems around that. And I don't remember if it was that podcast or a post I saw on Facebook later, but somebody had, it was, it was said something like, the moment I realized, as a shooter, the moment I realized that this is, let's say, the U.S. Open and the targets are meant to be harder, then I stopped being pissed off about it and I actually had fun, right? <laughs> That's expectations again, right? It is expectations. I mean, I think it's all... It, I mean, whether you're having fun or you're not having fun, all revolves around your expectation for the event, the day, you know, the, you know, the, the whole, the whole thing. And if, if your expectation is totally revolves around your score, when you go to the tournament, I think that's a very, um, that's a very destructive, negative way to, to look at that experience. I mean, I'm not saying winning's not important. Winning is important, but is it everything to the point that you would spend all of that money, go there and come home really pissed off about the whole thing? And I've actually done that and I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah, I was going to ask you, did you, have you ever been to a point where you're like, this sucks, I hate it and I want to quit, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore? Yeah, and I, and I, and I, think, I think the people that, that I know that, that got better were, you know, if they had something that happened, let's say it's a, in a shot or something, Unless they were dying, they couldn't wait to get back to the course and fix it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it bothered them so much. And, you know, I don't know where that fine line is, but you've got to have a sense of accomplishment, of pride, of relevance, of, you know, that it's going to bother you enough that you're going to do the things you can to get better. And that's kind of where I'm at with, with shooting. I don't know where the line is on that. Have I felt like quitting or been driving out up to a practice on a, you know, a rainy day or a day that wasn't ideal? Sure. I mean, I think everybody's gone through that. But, you know, it, it reminds me of a story that um, about Miller Huggins, who was a general manager of the New York Yankees in the early part of the last century. And I'll make this short in the 1920s. And he kind of fashioned the pinstripe, the winning attitude and the, you know, the, the culture that helped them become a, one of the winningest teams in baseball. And, you know, they'd been on a long stretch of road games. A pitcher came in and he said, I'm going to quit. And he said, what do you mean quit? He said, you're, you're important to this team. You're going to help us win uh, the pennant this year. He said, well, it's just too hard. Bill Huggins didn't miss a beat. And he said, you know, it's, it's the hard that makes the game worthwhile. It's the hard that makes the people that play the game special. Mm, so true, right? And, and that's how I feel about sporting clay. There is definitely something really admirable about competitive shooters, athletes, because they do keep coming back and they do keep like, how can I get better? How can I improve? And that was something I noticed when I was doing, you know, everyday private sessions in an office and 
you know, one session might be an athlete and the next session was a weight loss client. And this one particular time, and I, I know I've told you this story, but there's like this one time where both of these clients were on their third appointment. And the first appointment, they always did the 20 minute hypnosis for, they would take a, I would email it to them, right? 20 minute hypnosis for transformation audio. Do that every night or three to five times a week. That's part of your homework. And then here's your other homework, here's your other homework. And so here we were three weeks in, the weight loss client, I was like, how's your audio doing? How's your homework going? And what what audio? Wait, what? What am I supposed to be doing? You know, and I was like, okay, here we go again. But I had seen that in certain clientele, they weren't as invested. They weren't as motivated. They weren't, you know, and I think with weight loss, they can get feel hopeless because they've tried many different things. So there's other things happening as well. But that clay shooter who was on their third appointment was like, that's the coolest thing. I'm already seeing improvement. I'm sleeping better at night. Like, what else do you have for me? You know, like they was pumped up and excited. And that, of course, I love that because I really get my own high, my fun, my enjoyment. The magic for me is when I help somebody, right? So when I'm getting that feedback, there was like this like mutual like high going on. And um, that's what just kept, I kept going after, like, that's what I liked. I wanted to work with people who wanted the information, who actually but, did it. Yeah, and, and it's such a great give back sport. I mean, to me, it's as important to be as good for the sport as you are in the sport. Because it's given something back that makes it better. And the people that play the sport, that shoot shotguns at sporting clays, I mean, they're very generally giving people. So you want to be as good for the sport as you are in the sport. And that's what makes the quality of the people in the sport, I think, except. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've seen that. There's a lesson I teach related to the seven elements of peak performance. So, you know, we talked a lot about mechanics today. We've talked about the mental. I also feel like how you eat, how you sleep, how you drink, um, your endurance, your physical fitness, your faith all play a part. What, what's your thought on those areas as far yeah, as how those they are all kind of common sense things, and but I hadn't seen them packaged like that. And again, it goes back to that being intentional in your life for things that you want to get better. And, you know, I'd say some of those things are situational, but in that you already know them, but it, it brings it to the forefront. So if it's hot, should I drink more water? Am I prepared for that? Did I get enough sleep? You know, spiritually, am I in the right place? I mean, all of those things as the seven things have become more intentional in my life. And I think I'm better as a competitor, better as a person as a result of that. Are they common sense stuff? Yeah. But everything about getting better is about becoming a little more intentional about the things that you already know that you should be doing. And yeah. I just never seen it packaged. Up. That's so, you know, a lot of times competitors who travel a lot, they'll be like, oh, that's easy to eat decent when you're at home, but not when you're traveling. And, um, you know, Joe and I would travel a lot. So um, he's even said the same thing. And we just had this conversation with a competitive shooter the other day who, who was saying the same thing. And I'm like, you know what? It's about prioritizing and making time for things that you believe to be important. So if you think it's important, then, I mean, I, I've not done it every time. You know, I'll fly into San Antonio and sometimes I'm just exhausted from the flight. I feel nasty and dirty. I just want to go to the hotel or something. But if I make myself go to the grocery store and get those healthy, you know, snacks get some waters, get a little cooler, you know, get some proteins, like get some things that um, I can be sure to pack up. Because if I don't, then I'm going to go to that club. I'm going to go to whatever club it is the next morning. And I'm probably going to skip meals. I might get some food on the run or I might go to some fast food place. Um, and next thing you know, you know, five hours, six hours have gone by and I haven't drank the first water, even though it's on practically every station. I haven't eaten any snacks. And that's just me. I'm not even competing. And obviously, I feel the effects of skipping meals and not staying hydrated. So definitely for a competitor, they're going to feel that as well. Yeah. And if you let that, you, you let, it's like anything else in life. If you let that slip and slide, then, you know, it becomes worse, not better over time. And I, I always travel. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that I won't eat, you know, the fried food because I love fried food. But generally... I'm, I'm going to have my own food at the hotel in the room 
for breakfast. Or the Airbnb, right? Which or the Airbnb where I can cook, which is <laughs> awesome. Such a game changer. Where do you see yourself in five to 10 years with your shotgun sports? You know, at my age, you know, I just hope the next five years I can enjoy as much as I've enjoyed the last five years, stay healthy and so forth. But, you know, my, my plan is to uh, shoot in the 80s. I'd like to be a master class shooter, you know, and be better in, in that regard. Nice. What's uh, one big piece of advice that you would want to pass on to anybody listening or wisdom, some insight? You know, the one thing I hear repeatedly over and over again, and I think, and I've heard it from high level shooters all the way down to instruction to lower level shooters is your vision makes a big difference. And I went to Dr. Colo and, you know, I'm not center dominant, but I'm R2L2. And, you know, he, he said, you know, I'd rather have you and, and break 90 rather than not see and break 95 targets. And I said, well, I'd rather be in the 90s whether I'm seeing them or not. And so, you know, how, how you, where you pick the target up, how you see it, and that has evolved over the time, over time, because I had an instructor that he told me, well, I've told you this a hundred times, you just got to look at it. And I'd say, well, you know, it meant something different the hundredth time than it did the first time. So <laughs> I think your eyes, I think your eyes, the way you acquire targets, the way you see targets, you know, I think that's that's a huge deal for shooters at all levels. And um, get your eyes tested, know where, where you're going to pick the target up, know where you can see detail and why you may or may not be seeing detail. So I, th I think that's, that's key to the whole thing. Good info. And... You know, if anybody wants to be like David, they can get the dynamic duo at Amelia Shotgun Sports. <laughs> Instruction with Joe Skull, mental training with Dawn. Like, he's serious about this stuff. And we've enjoyed having you down and spending time with you whenever you come down. And you're like family to us at this point. So it's really cool. So if there, there are free goodies and opt-ins for all three of my businesses, including free golf cart rental at Amelia Shotgun Sports, uh, you just go to dongrant.com forward slash free. I guess you don't really have any products or services to promote. You know, you, you know what, I, what I would say, and I thought about that a little bit, and I don't, I, I really appreciate that, that the thing I would say about you and Joe, Joe and mechanics and you as far as the metal game is concerned, is that it, it has given me the foundation and the knowledge to know where I want to be. It's my responsibility to get there. And both have, have stuck with it in a way that you don't just teach it and forget it. You, you know, you continue to try to get me to do things that, you know, will either advance or, you know, that are holding me back. And I've really appreciated that. So I really appreciate it. And I want to thank both you and Joe Skull for the relationship. The other thing that I would say is I've shot a little more virtual reality. And I think it's it's amazing how far technology has come with that. And I don't think it's a substitute for going to the course, but I'm an hour away from my closest course. And there is virtual reality that is called a uh, clay hunt program. And, it, and the program costs 30 bucks. I mean, they've got like eight courses. Wow, I love that. Eight different courses, six shots per station, 10 stations. So it's a 60 shot round. You can shoot it in like 20 minutes. The headset costs $500. Stock cost, and I definitely would do an adjustable stock with it because it's more like the, the real thing. But it's wow. one of those things that I think really complements your ability. You know, if you had something that you really wanted to do better, there's a tournament mode on it and there's a practice mode on it. And you can just shoot till the cows come home and it doesn't cost 60 cents a, a yeah. you know, every time you pull the trigger. So, I mean, I think that is one of those things that I've, I've shot more of and I don't think it's a substitute for, but I think it's a real compliment to training. And I think with technology being what it is today and, and advancing so much that it's only going to get better. I love They've that. also got ski trap. They shoot game birds, all, all different kinds, and it's very, it's very realistic. And and I've seen the reviews on it, and some people said, well, you know, I bought it as a game, but now I use it as a practice tool. Totally, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, hopefully, yeah. it doesn't have super sporting, and so it'll be in trouble with fee task. <laughs> uh, you know, actually, you can set up a custom course. <laughs> Just teasing about that yeah. little drama happening. Nice. Well, folks can follow any of my businesses or me on social media. There's some good tips and such on there. 
And David, thank you very much for sharing your insight and wisdom and uh, look forward to seeing you continue to progress. Thank you so much for the invitation and all you've done for me. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Clay Mastermind with Dawn Grant. Mental excellence and industry insights brought to you by the Clay Lab. We hope you found today's episode inspiring and informative. Remember, mastering the middle game is key to unlocking your full potential on the course. And through our conversations with industry leaders, we aim to provide you with valuable insights into the world of clay shooting. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to follow, rate, and share it. For more insights, training tips, and updates on upcoming events, Dawn Grant and Amelia Shotgun Sports are on all social media platforms. Go to DawnGrant.com and come shoot at Amelia Shotgun Sports. Stay focused, stay driven, and keep pushing your limits. Until next time, Dawn wishes you success and happiness on your journey to peak performance and industry mastery.